Thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be here and um, I hope you enjoy what I'm about to say. Um, I'm a PhD stu student at Trinity College. I study linguistics. Um, as I go along, feel free to pop questions in the Slido Q&A um, and I will pick those up at the end uh, and I really look forward to hearing what you want to ask. So we'll move on to the next slide now, Richard. Great, thanks. So to kick things off, I thought we'd start with me getting to know you a bit since I've just told you who I am. So uh, if you head over to the Slido now, I'd like to ask, what languages do you speak or have you ever learned? Just pop them all in. Even if you've only learned a, a little bit, I would love to know what kind of languages we have in the room. Great, seeing a good number already. Keep adding them in. English definitely counts. I can see a few people are putting English in. That's great, that counts. <laughs> wow, real variety. This is really good to see. Um, just wait another few seconds. Great, so I hope that has opened everyone's eyes a bit to the amazing number of languages we have just in this quite small group, uh, about less than 30, well, about around 30 people. That's an amazing variety of languages. Um, so let's head back to the presentation now. So uh, hopefully you've all seen that's, you know, there are a lot of languages out there, even in this quite small group. In fact, across the world, there are hundreds and hundreds of languages. Um, and linguistics is all about studying those languages. But what exactly do I mean by that? That's what I'm going to talk about first. We'll have a look at what linguistics is, then I've got a challenge for you to have a go at um, finding some patterns. Then uh, we'll talk a bit about how languages change and have a go at listening out for linguistic variation. And then we'll move on to some questions. So first up, what is linguistics? Well, some of you may have never really heard of linguistics or you might have heard the word but not known exactly what it means. So I thought it would be worth starting today by clearing up what linguistics is as a subject. Next slide. So linguistics is sometimes characterised as the scientific study of language. It's not about learning a language, how to speak it or read it or how to write it, but it's about describing and analysing languages. The language itself is the object of study in linguistics. So we're interested in all kinds of facts about languages and how they're related. So like lots of subjects with a scientific approach, linguistics is all about finding patterns in data. And we use lots of different types of data, which means there are lots of types of linguistics. There should be a picture showing up, which I can't see at the moment. Ah, oh, there it is. Great. So in that bottom left hand corner, you should see a spectrogram, which is a type of graph. It shows the amount of energy at different frequencies as a word is pronounced. So uh, this is a spectrogram of the English word hiss. So how this graph works is um, the dark patches show where there's more energy. We've got frequency going up the y-axis and we've got time going along the x-axis. So as you, as someone says the word hiss, we see there's 
quite a lot of energy all across the range of frequencies at the start of the word. But then the s at the end, there's just more energy at very high frequencies. That's because that sound, that s sound, um, has high frequency. So that's just one type of data that linguistics uh, would uh, involve. So that's what we call phonetic data. It's about the sounds. It's really quite close to physics. So that might appeal to you if you have a somewhat scientific outlook. But at, at the other end of things, linguistics can be much more like a humanities subject. Um, let's move on. So what are the kinds of questions that linguists ask? And when I say linguists here, I mean people who do linguistics, not the other use of linguist, which means people who are learning languages or using languages. So we ask things like, what sounds do we find in this language? And what properties do they have? So we just saw we looked at the properties of some sounds of English in the last slide. We might ask, how does the grammar work? So how do you form a question, for example? Is the word order different? Uh, or are there other changes? We might ask, what are the words like in this language we're looking at? Do they tend to be short or long? Are they simple or complex? And we might look at other questions like, how do all these different properties vary between groups of speakers? Or how is the language changing over time? It's a lot going on. Uh, and all of these different types of questions fit into different branches of linguistics. Next slide. So my question, it's not really a question because I'm about to answer it, is linguistics just one subject? Well, kind of, yeah, because we're all looking at uh, one type of information or one type of um, object of study. We're looking at languages. Um, but linguistics has loads of subfields too. And we can look at that in different ways. So we can look at different aspects of a single language. We can look at the sound system, like we just did, have a look at the phonetics and what we call the phonology, which is about the relationships between different sounds and uh, how those are structured. We can look at the structure of words. And that comes back to this question of do we have short words or long words, simple or complex words? the structure of sentences, which we call syntax. And we could look at meanings, semantics, which is about how, it's about what words mean. You may have heard people say, oh, that's just a question of semantics. That means that's just about how you define your words. Or pragmatics, which is more to do with meaning in context. So if you imagine you are in a very cold room and um, the windows were wide open and you said to someone, oh, it's a bit cold in here, don't you think? What you might be saying to them implicitly is, can we shut the windows? <laughs> but you might be being polite and just trying to carry that meaning across to them without directly asking them to close the windows. That kind of meaning in context we call pragmatics. Well, as well as looking at different aspects of a single language, we can take different approaches to that data. So we can compare similar languages or different languages and see what they have in common. And we can look at previous versions of the language or you know, earlier records to see how the language has changed historically. Uh, that would be called historical linguistics. And I mentioned before looking at how language is different uh, across groups of speakers. That's sometimes called sociolinguistics. It's, you can think of it as relating sociology to linguistics. So we might look at linguistics um, or the linguistic properties of sp that speakers use of a particular age group or from a particular region, or maybe uh, look at sex differences or social class, for example. That gives us lots of different ways of slicing the data to see what's really happening in this language, because we know that language isn't homogenous between everyone. Then we can think about other interactions between different fields of research. So psycholinguistics and neurolinguistics, which deal with a language processing and language in the brain. 
and computational linguistics, which uses computational methods to investigate language. So you might think, um, if you think of um, Siri and Alexa, for example, they have a big grounding in computational linguistics so that the machine can act as an interface with the human language. So I, that's probably an information overload and there won't be a test, but I hope that gives you a little smidge of an idea of all the range of things that are included in this one subject of linguistics. So now it's time for a challenge. Uh, number one, finding linguistics pa linguistic patterns. So I mentioned that uh, linguistics is all about finding patterns in data. So here's just a tiny bit of data from an invented language. Um, in the table, you'll see we have two dialects of a language, a northern language and a southern language, and English translation. And there are two nouns there. There's a word that means house and a word that means wolf. And we've got the singular and plural for each of those words. So house, houses, and wolf, wolves. But one of our, uh, one of our slots in the table is empty. We have a, a missing word there. So as a mini linguistic challenge, can you have a look at this data and try and work out what should be in their missing box or their empty box? Uh, and I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that and add your answer to the Slido. Maybe we can give it another few seconds and then head over to the answer page. What do you yeah. think, Richard? <laughs> Amanda, I was being deliberately sneaky there because I was deliberately not presenting just to see yeah. what ideas could come up with students not being able to see what other people are putting. But I, that is I a think, bit sneaky, so I'll... No, I think that's a good now. idea. I think it's good to give people some time to think about it themselves and not be influenced by what everyone else thinks. Uh, so I think that's a great idea. So I'll give you another 30 seconds and then I'll project it up. Perfect. Great, so we've got a lot of answers. And it looks like the most popular one is Raregi, which is great. That's the right answer. And we've got a few other options there. Some Rarekis, a Raraki, it's close. Um, well, I'll explain why that's the answer uh, in a second when we head back over. But well done to everyone who had a go. I didn't give you very long to look at that. And it's not the most obvious task if you're not used to doing something like that. So thanks for having a go. Brilliant. So here's our solution. So we can look at the word for house and we see that in the northern dialect, it's got an R in the middle when in the southern dialect it's got an L in the middle. And we can also see that the southern forms always have a B, but the northern forms, the singular has a P and the north and the plural form has a B. So after the vowel, uh, uh, sorry, before the vowel, we've got B instead of P. And that B is shared with the southern forms. So Extrapolating from one data point is not ideal, but in this situation, uh, we're going to say, OK, we expect this word wolf to behave quite like house. So we're going to have the same uh, 
consonant in the middle, the r, that we see um, in the northern forms throughout, just like we've got l in the southern forms throughout, in the middle of the word. But that consonant at, near the end, right before the vowel, well, that's going to be the same as we see in the southern forms. Now, there's a reason um, why in the northern dialect, we have p in the singular and b in the plural and k in the singular and g in the plural. And that's that those sounds, p and b and k and g, are both very similar to each other. There's just one difference in how you articulate, how you make those noises. And the adding the vowel after the sound in this northern dialect seems to make sp speakers use the uh, second of those, so b and g rather than p and k. Uh, if anyone wants to have a more in-depth explanation of that, maybe put it in the Q&A because it will take a few minutes to explain it and we don't have very long, sadly. But I hope that gives you a little taste of finding some linguistic patterns. Uh, I think we have one more slide on this, yeah. So this was fake data, it was a made up language. Um, and I told you there were two dialects, a Northern and a Southern, but we usually find that closely related languages have quite small differences in sound patterns, or you could think closely related language varieties tend to sound quite similar. But the types of differences we find, like this difference in which consonant we get um, before a vowel, they're often quite similar across lots of language groups, which means we can eventually make some predictions about the types of changes we will find in languages. OK, I think it's time for me to move on to my next bit of the talk, which is about how languages change. So. Languages don't stay the same forever, which is probably quite obvious when you stop and think about it, because if you've ever read some Shakespeare or maybe you've seen the old English poem Beowulf, you might know that the further back in time you go, the harder it is to read that language and to understand the English. And even on a really small scale, you can probably think of some new words or phrases that have come into use in the last year, or maybe some new uses for old words. So I had a think and I came up with some completely new words that I hadn't really used before March last year. Uh, Zoom bombing, uh, when someone who wasn't invited joins a Zoom call. Doom scrolling, where you just keep scrolling through your phone. And COVID, obviously the disease maybe slightly longer than a year now. And then new uses for old words. If you said before, maybe a year ago, oh, I'm in a bubble with my mum's friend, everyone would be like, what are you on about? You can't you meet, like, what does bubble, like, what's a bubble? Why are you saying that? But everyone knows what a bubble was, like a soap bubble or something. Or like, you might have talked about like, being in a bubble, like not listening to other people. But this use of bubble is new to talk about like a household bubble. And same with distancing, right? If you said, oh yeah, we stayed socially distant or like, oh, we were doing really good distancing. Before a year ago, everyone would have thought you were mad because that's just not a, you that, that word has gained a completely new use um, quite recently. So it's easy to think about changes at that level of the language, about new vocabulary. And maybe you've come across in previous years, the like Oxford Dictionary's word of the year. I think a couple of years ago, they chose an emoji, which was quite controversial. But we're all familiar with changes in word use. But what about changes beyond words? Um, well, grammar and sound systems also change over time, and you're probably aware of that too, although you might not realise it or have ever thought about it. But if you listen to uh, a really old radio programme, or even if you talk to older speakers of, uh, of English, you'll notice that they say some sounds differently or have particular patterns in their speech that maybe you don't have. 
And this happens on a small scale, but also on a really big scale over hundreds or thousands of years. And that's how we end up with languages um, changing a lot um, uh, over time and uh, across places. You can get really different regional varieties um, of languages arising. So I saw a lot of you had put down French as a language. Uh, and I did guess that a few people might know some French. So let's have a look at some French, but maybe not as you know it. This is some really early French. So on the left, you've got a manuscript, which is called the Oaths of Strasbourg, um, which was uh, from 842 AD. And this is often thought of as being the first bit of written French that we have. Um, so I've given you because um, it's quite hard to read. It's got old fashioned handwriting as well as being old French. Uh, in the middle, I've given you the typed out version of the first uh, few clauses of that. And then on the right, you've got a modern French translation. And there's also an English translation at the bottom um, to help you understand what's going on. So. Don't get hung up on this. Um, if you've never looked at any French before, uh, and I don't expect anyone to have done any old French before, but just have a look and uh, see what you can spot in there. Um, and maybe have a look at the bit I've highlighted in green, where you'll see some quite different word order. So the old French says, and Excuse my pronunciation. In quant Deus savi et podia me donat. And the modern French says, Autant que Dieu m'en donne le savoir et le pouvoir. So maybe you can see savi et podia. That's the same as le savoir et le pouvoir, the knowing and the power. And those in Old French are coming before the verb and the objects, uh, so, well, the recipient. So it's God giving power, knowledge and powers to me, but it's God, uh, knowledge and power, me gives. But in the modern French, we've got God, me gives the knowledge and the power. So you can see already some differences in the word order um, that have happened since 842 AD um, up to the modern French. Right, enough of that. Um, let's move on to the next one. So that might have got you thinking, where did French come from? And where did this old French uh, originate from? French is one of a whole family of languages that come from Latin. So you might think the old French text looks a bit like Latin. That's because it still has some features that were in Latin, but aren't in modern French, just because of the way that the language has developed. And we call all these languages from Latin, the Romance languages. It's like the Romans. Um, it's not like romantic, although um, maybe you think that these languages are romantic anyway. That's a personal thought. Um, so some other Romance languages are Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Romanian, Catalan, Galician, Occitan, and many more minor varieties that you may not have heard of. Um, especially in Italy, we get loads and loads of different um, varieties. And English has borrowed lots of words from Latin and the Romance languages, but it's actually from a different family called Germanic. Um, let's move on. So what is this idea of language families? Well, sometimes it's conceptualized as being like a family tree with a mother language and some daughter languages. These closely related languages, the sisters, have lots of similarities. They share features that they've got from their source language which could include similarities in vocabulary, sound systems, or grammatical systems. So on the right, I've put up a little table of some similarities in vocabulary across some Romance languages. So it should be pretty obvious that uh, lots of the words for numbers are very similar across all the Romance languages because they're all from the Latin numbers. And these Romance languages, 
are actually part of an even bigger language family, the Indo-European languages, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. So this is a really beautiful diagram, I think. It's art really rather than a diagram. Um, and it shows you the language family tree of Indo-European. And also on the right, there's a little uh, diagram of Uralic uh, languages, which is a separate family. So the, in the Indo-European tree, you can look up the European branch and find the Italic branch, the Romance branch, and that will show you where um, some of these Romance languages can be conceptualized. So we've got a, a Gallo-Iberian branch, which has French on, and uh, we've got a Ibero-Romance branch, that refers to Iberia, which is where Spanish and Portuguese are found. But if we look across this whole tree, there are all kinds of languages that are also Indo-European, but um, not so closely related. So languages like Hindi and Urdu, English, as I mentioned, in the Germanic branch, along with German, Dutch, Danish, Swedish, and many more. And Maybe that's blown your mind a little. I know it did blow my mind when I first discovered how many languages are all related. Let's move on now. So these modern Indo-European languages ultimately all share one source or ancestor language, uh, which we refer to as Proto-Indo-European, which was probably originated somewhere in the west of Russia, but we're not quite sure. Small variations, um, well, that language then got spread out as the speakers of the language went about um, taking over different uh, or just traveling from place to place. And small variations between the language of different groups of speakers as they spread out have over time resulted in languages that look and sound very different. And we probably don't even realize that our languages are related to all those other ones. We definitely couldn't understand everyone who speaks a language from somewhere else in our language family tree. So now um, we're going to go a bit more small scale again and look at two varieties of Portuguese which have diverged in the last few hundred years. And why Portuguese? It's a bit random, but that's what I work on. So I thought I'd share some of this with you. So the two varieties we're going to be looking at are Brazilian Portuguese and European Portuguese, which is the Portuguese that is spoken in Portugal. Um, and Portuguese is spoken in many other places as well, which are marked on the map in green or yellow. OK, let's move on. The next uh, challenge I have for you, which is just to, just to round us off for today, um, I'm going to play you a one minute clip and you're going to hear two Portuguese speakers having a chat. There's a Brazilian Portuguese speaker, Virginia. She's going to introduce it. And then there's a European Portuguese speaker called Nuno. Um, and he's going to be answering her questions. Uh, so there's no pressure on this, but have a listen to this clip and see if you can hear any differences in the sounds of the two varieties. And be bold, put anything you notice onto the Slido. Um, and don't worry if you have no idea, that is absolutely fine. I will just take us a moment to start the video. And while I do that, Amanda, um, just say thank you so much for the questions which have started coming in. Please oh, yeah. Great. carry on bringing them in while I just... Yeah, I would love to have your questions to answer at the end, so do keep adding them on and we'll get through as many as we can. Right, start, here we go. Start with a little bit of music. Você? Eu sou do Portugal, mais precisamente da cidade do Porto. Você é casado com uma brasileira, né? Com a minha querida amiga Fernanda. E você morou no Brasil por um tempo. E eu queria muito saber como que foi a sua experiência de morar no Brasil com relação à língua. Você teve alguma dificuldade de comunicação com os brasileiros? Você conseguia entendê-los bem? Eles conseguiam entender bem o que você falava? Como que foi essa experiência? 
foi... Foi divertida. <risos> uh, fui sempre muito bem recebido no Brasil. Uh, eu já tinha visitado algumas vezes uh, o Brasil até que me mudei para lá, para São Paulo. Uhum. Na comunicação, eu sentia que eu entendia 95% do que eu ouvia ao meu redor. Uhum. Não era recíproco. O que eu mais ouvi nos primeiros meses foi... Oi? <risos> Até que eu fui me adaptando, usando a, a, a linguagem, ou a adaptação do meu português de Portugal para o português do Brasil, uhum. para me fazer entender. Uhum. Então, a quantidade de oi reduziu, então <risos> acho que tive sucesso. <risos> Great. Well, I hope that wasn't too overwhelming. Um, and... I would just love to hear if you heard any differences or noticed something interesting about those two speakers and their Portuguese. So do add anything you can think of to the Sido. I can see some good answers popping in, which is great. Yeah, all some all good ideas here. So her speaking flowed more. And yeah, the vowels are longer in what? Yeah, Brazil had longer vowels. Um, but the European speaker, his his sounded kind of harsher. Um, she sounded more melodic. Yeah, all of these are things that people often notice about the two varieties of Portuguese. Um, and yeah, Portuguese D sounds J. That's a really good uh, point, whoever uh, noticed that. Um, so in the Brazilian Portuguese, uh, instead of saying D, you will say G. Uh, you say the vowel longer and the d sound is very different. So uh, it's really great that you can notice some of these differences. And there are good linguistic explanations for all of these differences. One of the main ones that you've noticed is the vowels. And it's true, Brazilian Portuguese speakers tend to pronounce their vowels more uh, distinctly the vowels last longer, whereas the European Portuguese vowels tend to be much shorter, which can make it sound that there are lots of consonants close together, which can give this impression of harshness. People sometimes say Brazilian Portuguese sounds more like Italian or Spanish, and European Portuguese sounds more like Russian, which isn't so closely related, but it has uh, lots of consonants close together, uh, which we sometimes feel like we can hear in European Portuguese. Um, right, shall we switch back over to the presentation just for the last slide of that? But really well done to everyone uh, for having a listen and putting your ideas out there. I'm really impressed with the level of um, like detail that you got just from one minute of um, Portuguese. So thank you very much. Okay, on the next slide, uh, and I know I'm running out of time, uh, but I've got some uh, ideas like what, how are European and Brazilian Portuguese different? Uh, there are lots of types of differences. We've just talked about the accent or sound systems with different vowels or different consonants and maybe different tunes, intonation patterns. So someone said that the Brazilian sounds more melodic. Yeah, it might have more variation between the highs and lows in pitch. And they're like with lots of languages with different varieties, there's different vocabulary. Brazilians say ônibus for bus and Portuguese people say autocamo. And there are differences in grammar as well, uh, which I'm not gonna get into too much, but generally speaking in European Portuguese, you can have a verb without a subject before it. So you can say like chocolate, but in Brazilian Portuguese, you have to include the subject. You have to say, I like chocolate. Um, great. 
So that's a whistle stop tour of some differences between European and Brazilian Portuguese, as well as all the um, how languages change, language families, and a few other ideas. So I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks very much for listening and contributing all your thoughts. And I'd love to take some questions next. Thank you, Amanda. Uh absolutely fascinating and you could see by the engagement as well in your uh, task there uh, that our um, guests found it so I have a number of questions that have come in from uh, our guests uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to take them in a sort of more most general first and then we'll get more specific Perfect. Um, so we'll start off with um, how did you come to be interested in linguistics oh yeah it's a good question, but I don't have a great answer. Um, when I was thinking of applying for university, I came across the Mon Languages and Linguistics course and I thought, oh, that sounds interesting. I wonder what linguistics is. And I did a bit of investigation and realised that linguistics had in it some of the things that I'd always found really interesting, but had never really studied as a subject. So um, I'd always been really interested in learning grammars of languages, how they fit together, like uh, why does Latin have all these like case forms and different verb forms that other languages I've looked at don't and like how did that happen? Um, so it was kind of an accident. I was really lucky that my Latin teacher uh, at school, I was very lucky I was even doing Latin, um, but the Latin teacher at school was really helpful and helped me kind of track down a couple of books I could read but um, it was just coincidence really like you, you don't learn linguistics at school like you might come across some grammatical analysis or something or some people do English language at A level which has a lot of linguistics in it but um, yeah it's something you happen across I think. OK, just personally to pick you up on just a simple question based on what you just said, where did you study as an undergraduate the first time you did a uh, university, you went to university? I was actually at Oxford then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. And um, another one that's sort of related to you personally, do you speak any other languages? Oh, um, yeah. So linguists get asked this all the time uh, and I do speak a few, but uh, not very well. My Portuguese is quite good. Um, I did Portuguese as an undergraduate uh, and I have French and Spanish A level. So I have deep, like OK French Spanish, not great for speaking anymore, but all right for reading. Um, and I can read Italian. I've learned a bit of Romanian. I've learned a bit of Indonesian and a bit of Galician. So like I like picking things up, but um, like with everything, you use it or you lose it. And I haven't been the best at keeping up with my speaking. Great. I have a funny sense that your definition of not being so hot in a particular language might be slightly different, different to uh, mine. Uh, I'm going to come back to um, sort of university courses. There's quite a theme here. Um, do, um, do modern foreign language courses mostly include linguistics? All oh, right. So this really varies from place to place. Um, in some places, linguistics is a standalone subject and in other places it is only as part of modern languages. Um, at Oxford, that which is what I'm most familiar with and it's probably the most relevant since you're here, um, there's a modern languages and linguistics joint course, but there's also the possibility to read modern languages and take some linguistics within that course. And you may also find that if you read English at some universities, you can take some linguistics. And just for another option, uh, in Oxford and a few other places have similar courses. There's a philosophy, psychology and linguistics course. So if you're more interested in like the psychology and the philosophy behind language, then that might be one to look into. Um, but it really varies a lot between universities. Um, and you may find there isn't a course called linguistics, but there are ways of doing some linguistics in lots of courses. Okay, yeah. on, on which note, would a linguistics plus a modern foreign languages like joint degree cover fewer aspects of linguistics than a solo linguistics degree? Um, I would say not necessarily, 
um, I did that joint course, Modern Languages and Linguistics, and I had a really wide grounding in linguistics. Possibly you go slightly less deep into some of the areas uh, than if you were just reading linguistics. Um, but I really liked the variety of having a language and some literature as well. Um, so I think, yeah, maybe. You have to have to do your own research on that one, perhaps. <laughs> to come to a semi-related question that I think is uh, more about the study of linguistics rather than necessarily sort of university courses. Mm. Do you have to pick one language to study linguistics or do you do multiple, which I take to mean, can you study linguistics across loads of languages rather than needing to study it through the prism of, say, French or Romanian yeah. and so on? Yeah, definitely. Um, so there are lots of different approaches some people say if you only speak English you can study linguistics only knowing English that's absolutely fine but also um, if you are interested in comparing lots of different languages that's very possible as well there's a whole branch of linguistics called typology or linguistic typology that looks at all the relationships between uh, types of languages so how can we classify languages, group them together? And to do that, you're never going to speak all the languages in the world, clearly. You're probably never even going to speak 10 or 20, but um, you can get a good enough knowledge of how they're structured and how the grammar works or how the sound systems work. Uh, and that way you can do linguistics of lots of languages at a time. A delightful question in the sense that I infer that it's come from a, a younger guest here. What, um, not necessarily, what what A-levels would help for linguistics? Um, yeah, good question. I think if you have the chance to do a modern language, that can be useful because you often will learn some grammar as part of modern languages, uh, but it's not a necessity. Um, English or English language, the same reason, um, really, we're not fussy, like lots of things are useful. Uh, if you're particularly interested in doing any computational linguistics, then it might be helpful to do maths, but that's definitely not required. I didn't do maths A level. Um, if you have the chance to do classics, that could be helpful. If you have the chance to do English language, that would definitely be useful, but again, it's not required. Um, so really, you, you have a lot of options out there and um, having something language related is obviously good, but um, there are many possibilities. Got you, yeah. Um, just to come, I'm going to conclude with a couple of very specific ones, but also to come to a couple on um, sort of university study of languages mm. and or linguistics. There's one, can you study more than one language? And I'm guessing that's about sort of languages related degrees. And if I can just pitch mm. in on that, um, I'd say at most universities, most language related courses do involve the study of more than one language. There are courses where you can just study the one. And also I think really important to emphasize at this point is there are a lot of university courses, a range of different universities, including Oxford, where you can further your study of something you're already studying be it say French, German, Spanish, whatever it is, and you can also start a language from afresh yeah. um, where it's expected you have no prior knowledge. Would you like to add, in, add anything to, the, to that? Yeah, no, that's definitely true. You can do courses with just one language or with two. In some universities, I think Durham might be one, you can apply to do three languages. Um, and yeah, as you say, the ab initio or from scratch beginners languages courses are really something to look into if you're interested in languages, like don't rule it out. Um, I did beginners Portuguese and linguistics, which was a bit rogue starting two things from scratch, but it worked out all right in the end. Um, so and to jump in actually with one of the questions on that, Amanda, sorry to interrupt, yeah. uh, what A-levels did you do? Oh, I did French, Spanish, English literature and Latin. Wow. And maths AS level, but I don't do much maths day to day. <laughs> wow, that's um, that's impressive. Uh, I love the, a question that particularly combines the two strands of what we've looked at today. Uh, what kind of super curriculars would you recommend for linguistics? Oh, right. Um, yeah, good question. Um, there are 
there are some really good intro level books on linguistics out there. Um, so you mentioned the very short introductions. There's one on language and there's one on linguistics. Both of those are pretty good. Um, if you want something a little more, uh, a little longer or more challenging, there are some great kind of popular linguistics books out there. Um, one that everyone always gets recommended, but I do think it's a good book, even if it's a bit outdated now, is by Steven Pinker. It's called The Language Instinct. Uh, and I had a look earlier at what the Oxford Linguistics faculty recommend, and they say there's a book called The Wonders of Language or How to Make Noises and Influence People. I haven't read that, so I can't really vouch for it, but that sounds like a lot of fun. That's by Ian Roberts. Um, so some reading is a great place to start. Um, and there are also some great linguistics podcasts out there, too. Um, there's one called Because Language. Oh, no, wait, that's a book. That's not a podcast. I can't remember what the podcast I'm thinking of is called. It used to be called Talk the Talk, but its name has changed and now I can't remember. But yeah, there, have a look. There's a whole world out there. Just, just for everyone who's interested in those, I popped those in an answer to that question on Slido. So if you missed the, any of those titles, they're on there. Great, thank oh, you. Excellent, thanks, Chris. And what careers possibilities stem from a linguistics degree? Um, yeah, another good question. So like lots of humanities degrees or less vocational degrees, there are a lot of options out there that linguistics doesn't necessarily like funnel you towards. So linguistics graduates can go on to all kinds of things like um, law or the civil service or um, kind of all kinds of like general graduate schemes. But if uh, you're talking about things that specifically need linguistic skills, uh, one thing would be working in language technology companies. So I mentioned like the um, Siri and Alexa, that kind of thing. So as well as the big firms like uh, Google and Amazon, there are some smaller language startups that hire linguists to work on their language tech. And there are also careers in forensic linguistics, which involves looking at ling language to help solve crimes uh, or to kind of track. Uh, yeah, I guess that's yeah, that's the that's the short answer. And um, all kinds of other things. Uh, often linguistic skills can be useful for translation, uh, for um, editing, publishing, um, all kinds. Yeah. Brilliant. To come to one specifically, we've got about four minutes remaining, Amanda. So these are all pretty quick fire questions okay. now. Uh, dovetailing with that, for speech and language therapy, is there a bit of uh, linguistic theory in there? Yeah. Um, Typically, you would read a slightly different course called Applied Linguistics, which is more about um, applying linguistic methodologies to different problems. So, yeah, uh, there are also separate courses that specialise in speech and language therapy, but linguistics is definitely helpful for that. Brilliant. What do you focus on in your PhD in a nutshell? I'm, I'm looking at how Portuguese grammar has changed over time. Uh, particularly at the verb system and some pronoun differences. Brilliant. In and then I said, I said I'd get more specific, so I'm going to end with two really specific ones. Okay. Um, yeah. Where is, uh, I'm, I'm so sorry, I don't know how to pronounce this. Is it Occitan or Occitan? Oh, Occitan. Occitan, uh, right. Where's Occitan spoken? It's the very south of France. Oh. Yeah. And... The most specific question, how do you use the data you get from a spectrogram? Oh, right. Um, yeah, good question. Um, well, what you would typically be doing is having a lot of different uh, speakers, for example, or a lot of different copies of the same uh, word and comparing them to see what is different about the way certain sounds are pronounced by particular speakers. So let's say you wanted to say, is there a difference between how men and women say the sound s? Or is there a difference between how American and English uh, speakers say the sound t in a word like stop? 
um, so you would be comparing the levels of energy at different points in the spectrogram. But I'm not a phonetician, so that that's that's my take on it. That's why you would want to collect that type of data. If that was your attempt to say you're not an expert, um, I don't think I'd uh, accept that for one <laughs> moment based on what you've just um, taken us through. Amanda, thank you so much. I, I think you've managed to make this so accessible um, and clear. Um, and I think the way you've delivered everything you've said has just been absolutely wonderful. So m huge thanks from us. And um, a reiteration to our guests, thank you so much for your great questions. You've really kind of taken Amanda into specific fields with them. Um, and a reminder that we will send a follow up email um, probably just under 24 hours time tomorrow afternoon with a recording of the session uh, and also links to those um, URLs and indeed the wider PDF of the presentation that Amanda's so wonderfully, wonderfully delivered this afternoon. Great. Amanda, so any much. concluding comments? Off? Great. Yeah, I just want to say thanks so much. I really enjoyed the questions and I hope a few of you go on to look more into linguistics. Uh, I'm really biased, but it's a great subject. <laughs> and just to finish, uh, just to go back into super curricular and lifelong learning, I'm going to get a Stephen Pinker book off my bookshelves and um, and uh, go dip into that now. Not necessarily now, but soon. Great. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks. Well, Bye. Bye, everyone.